All right. Uh, well, we continue in our study of the book of Luke. As you know, we're traveling through the book of Luke, and we are in Luke chapter 6 today. So if you will, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 1. Luke chapter 6, verse 1. And I'm going to ask you to stand as we read God's Word this morning. Luke chapter 6, we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. The Bible says, On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those with him. And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there, and Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them, all he said to him, all he said to him, Stretch out your hand, and he did so, and his hand was restored, but they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Well, let us pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for the time of worship we've already had. Lord, we thank you so much as the choir has, has reminded us that you still reign, that you are ruling. Lord, that is so comforting to know as we live in this chaotic world, this world that is filled with so much evil. We thank you that you still have a plan. And you are victorious and all who know Christ are victorious through you. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word. Speak to us now, and we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This past Easter, the Pope did something um, that was out of the norm. He, he did something just on the Thursday before Easter, He washed the feet of 12 disabled and elderly people, and in that group were both women and non-Catholics. And he did this to show his willingness to serve like a slave. Now you say, well, what's so bad about that? Well, the problem is, is what he did was, is it broke tradition. The Pope broke the rules, and there were a a group of traditional Catholics that were very upset by what he did because traditionally in this ceremony, the Pope would only wash the feet of men, men who were Catholics, other priests, and so they were greatly upset that the Pope broke their rules. And in our text today, we find that Jesus was also a rule breaker. And in our text, we we find him really upsetting the Pharisees and the other uh, ones who were very religious. He upset them over this issue of the Sabbath. And so we're going to look at that today. Everywhere Jesus went, there was controversy. And as we have studied through the book of Luke, we see that the further we we journey to the cross, the more and more upset the religious leaders of the day got at Jesus. Because, you see, Jesus didn't keep the rules. He broke their traditions. He did some things that greatly upset them. If you recall, uh, they were upset because he called sinners to be his disciples when he called Matthew, the tax collector. They were upset with him because he actually ate and fellowshiped with sinners. 
He violated the tradition. Last week we saw where they were upset at him because they, he, he and his disciples violated their rules regarding fasting. And then today we come to this text where we see Jesus breaking the rules regarding the Sabbath. Now you remember the Pharisees were a group of Jews who advocated a very minute, detailed obedience to the law. And then some. Their religion was known as Judaism, and Judaism was built on rules, regulations, and traditions. And many of these were man-made rules and traditions, and they prided themselves as being um, the religious elite because they were the ones who, who um, in their eyes, did well in their religious performance. In fact, they kind of... Um, gave themselves the, the, the title of being the keepers of the law. And so they were the, the religious police of the day. And, of course, Jesus comes along and he doesn't fit in their box. Remember from last week we talked about the, the old wineskins or the new wine being placed in old wineskins and Jesus said it just doesn't work. Their religious system, it was so, it was so bound by man-made rules, it was so rigid that it could not contain the power of the gospel. And so they hated Jesus. And we find Jesus here in the midst of another controversy. This time it's regarding the Sabbath. As you know from the Old Testament law, the Sabbath would have been on Saturday. And uh, Jewish life in Jesus' day really revolved around the Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath. It was very, very important. Now, we have to understand that when God instituted the Sabbath, God gave it, the, the intent behind the Sabbath was to be a benefit to man. It was designed to be a day of rest, a, a time where the, the, the people of God could worship and they could heal and they could, they could use that opportunity as a day to show mercy and kindness to one another. So it was meant to be a benefit, but sadly by the time Jesus comes on the scene, instead of it being a benefit, it was a burden. It was a burden. And the Pharisees and the scribes hated Jesus, and they were looking for any way they could bring some charge against him, so they, they used this issue of the Sabbath to try to prove that he had violated the law. And so what we're going to do is, as we look at this text, I've, I've divided this into two major divisions. First of all, in verses 1 through 5, we're going to look at Sabbath snacking. Snacking. Sabbath snacking. And then we're going to close in verses 6 through 11, and we're going to see Sabbath healing. Sabbath snacking and Sabbath healing. So let's look at these these uh, divisions. First of all, we see Sabbath snacking. Here we find Jesus... In these first five verses, him and his disciples, they are strolling on a Sabbath afternoon stroll. They're just strolling along and they come to this uh, field, this grain field, and uh, some of the disciples are plucking some of the grain off of the head and they're rubbing it in their fingers and they're snacking on the grain. Okay. Now, according to the law in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 25, we see that they were not violating the law by doing this. The law said that if you were, if you were passing by a field, you could pluck some of the grains off. You could snack. Now, you couldn't go out there with a sickle and start harvesting it. I mean, we have several farmers here. I mean, you can imagine if you had several hundred acres of, of corn and somebody walked by and they, you know, they decide they want a corn, uh, ear of corn, so they may take an ear of corn. Well, that's, you know, that's, Probably wouldn't be too offended by that. I mean, you have several hundred acres of corn. What's one head of, ear of corn going to do? But if they if they showed up with a tractor and they started harvesting several acres of corn, well, then that's another issue. But here are these disciples. Their profession. They're not farmers. They're fishermen, most of them, and they're just kind of snacking on these um, grains of uh, or these heads of grain and just kind of. Minding their own business. Well, then the Pharisees come along and they have this complaint. They are very upset because in their minds, 
they saw that what the disciples were doing was they were working and it was the Sabbath. So they had violated the law. And they were very upset. By them picking, they were in essence reaping, which would have been forbidden on the Sabbath. By them rubbing the husk together, they were in their minds threshing the grain. They were winnowing the grain by throwing the husk away. And so ultimately, these disciples were working on the Sabbath because they were preparing food. That's what they were doing. And that was totally unacceptable according to the Pharisees. In their minds, they should have prepared their food on Friday before the Sabbath. And again, the Jews in Jesus' day held the Sabbath as being very, very sacred. So clearly, the Pharisees were on the job. They were looking to find something that they could pin against Jesus and His disciples. Again, the Sabbath was intended to be a day of rest, but the Pharisees turned it into a legalistic burden. It was something that that they saw, and, and they built all kinds of man-made rules around the law, and, and it was, instead of being a benefit, it was a burden to the people. So they took, the, the Pharisees took the Sabbath to a whole new level. They went far beyond what the law said. Now, we're not going to go there, but in the law, in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, in the book of Deuteronomy, the Lord simply says to, to set aside a day of rest, the Sabbath. But now, the Pharisees were so concerned about keeping the law, that this is what they did. They built fences around the law. They, they developed all kinds of man-made rules in order to protect themselves from ever violating the law. So then what ultimately happened was over time, the man-made rules now became the law. So if you violated the man-made rules, you were guilty of offending God by violating His law. So they established 39 categories of actions, activities that were forbidden on the Sabbath. It was said by one individual, it was difficult for Jews to get any rest on the Sabbath day because they were so busy making sure they didn't work. Now there is a book called the Mishnah. This was an ancient Jewish rule book and it spelled out some of these guidelines. And I wanted to share some of these with you. These are Some of these are rather humorous. Again, these were all the, the man-made rules that the religious ones of the day established so that you wouldn't violate the Sabbath. They said, people were forbidden from traveling more than 3,000 feet from their homes on the Sabbath. A Jew could not carry an object that weighed more than, uh, more than a dried fig. But an object that weighed half that amount could be carried twice. One could eat nothing larger than an olive. Well... Us Baptists, we would be in trouble. No fried chicken on the Sabbath day. You could not throw an object into the air with one hand and catch it with the other. Nothing could be bought or sold. Clothing could not be washed or dyed. A letter could not be sent. A fire, this is good, a fire could not be lit or extinguished. If you failed to light your lamps before the Sabbath, you had to sit in the dark until the next evening. Jews could not take a bath on the Sabbath. If they did, some of the water might splash onto the floor, and this would be considered washing it. Chairs or other heavy objects could not be moved because dragging them might make a furrow in the ground, and that would be considered plowing. Ladies, you're going to like this one. A woman could not look into a uh, into could not look into a looking glass because she might see a gray hair and be tempted to pull it out. <laughs> Did you like that? Uh, this is another good one. False teeth could not be worn because they exceeded the weight limits. So needless to say, the, the Pharisees, they missed the point 
of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a burden. It was not a blessing. And so, as you can imagine, their life was not a celebration. Their life was was just a funeral. I mean, it was just dread. And you know what? The Pharisees, they didn't even keep up with all this nonsense. But they saw themselves as very religious, as ones who were honoring God. And you know what? Even today, there is a danger if we're not careful to demand and say more than what the Scriptures say. And we begin to build fences in our lives. And before we know it, those fences now become sacred. So we have to be very, very careful. And so Jesus and His disciples were violating the Sabbath according to their rules and standards. And so because the disciples were doing it in the eyes of the Pharisees, Jesus was just as guilty. Because really, their concern was not with the disciples. Their concern was with Jesus. They hated Jesus. Because Jesus was a threat to their prestige, to their influence. So they sought any way they could to accuse Jesus. Well, notice the Lord's response in verses 3 through 5. While Jesus and disciples may have violated the Pharisees' rules, they were clearly not breaking any divine law. And so how does Jesus respond to this? Uh, there's, there's many ways he could have responded to it, but he, he responds with a question. And he says, he says, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And those who were with him, how he entered into the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those with him? And he said to them, the, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. I love the way Jesus responded to the Pharisees and the religious uh, leaders. This is, this is wisdom here. He responds here by saying, have you not read? Now that would have been very offensive to the Pharisees. Because remember, they saw themselves as the experts of the law. So in their minds, they would have been saying, of course we have read this. He would have been quoting out of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 3-6. through 6, You have David... And David is, is at a place in his life where he is very desperate. He is a famished refugee. He was hungry. He was fleeing from his life from Saul. Saul was pursuing David because Saul wanted to kill David. And so his men, him and his men, they're hungry. They come to the land of Nob. And there is a priest there. His name was Ahimelech. And uh, he realizes that David and his men have a problem. They're hungry. They need food. Now, in the Old Testament law, in the tabernacle, there would be 12 loaves of bread that would be placed out. And every week on the Sabbath, on the Sabbath, those loaves of bread would be replaced with fresh bread. And the old loaves, according to the law, could only be eaten by the priest. Well... This priest here realizes that David and his men, they have a problem. They have a need. And so he lets them eat the, the bread. And so he, he understood, he understood that, that God desires mercy above sacrifice. That priest understood that. That, that man's need was more important than ceremonial Regulations. Now, this was Jesus was not giving this illustration as a license to sin, to go out and just purposely violate the law. But he's making a point to the Pharisees that, that God desires mercy above sacrifice. And they were completely blind to that. And in essence, what Jesus is saying here is, if a human priest, a Him, uh, Himalek, if he could permit, if he could give David permission to violate part of God's ceremonial law because there was a, there was a, a need there, that people had a genuine need, then he, being the Son of Man, certainly had the authority to give his disciples the authority to pluck grains of head on the Sabbath. And you notice there in verse 5, he says, the Son of Man, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. In essence, Jesus is claiming deity. He said, I created the Sabbath, therefore I have the right to decide what behavior is fitting and not fitting on the Sabbath. All right, so we have Sabbath snacking. Now we move into verses 6 through 11. We have our second major division, and we uh, come to this issue of Sabbath healing. We see Jesus healing on the Sabbath. Now, by this time, 
And more than likely, it doesn't say uh, as far as time frame when this happened. More than likely, this was probably the very next Sabbath. Okay, And they're already upset because on the previous Sabbath, they had busted Jesus and his disciples doing work on the Sabbath. And so now, they're, they're upset. And so they are really, they come looking for Jesus to make a mistake. Uh, in fact, verse 11 tells us, that they were at the end of this, at the end of this story, they are, they are fuming. The Gospel of Mark tells us that they were plotting to murder Jesus by this point. Now do you see the, the hypocrisy here? Here's, here's these religious ones, they're upset with Jesus because Jesus and his disciples had plucked some grain off of some, in a grain field and were just simply snacking on some grain because they were hungry, they're upset with Jesus because he heals a man, and they tell Jesus that he had he had dishonored God because he he violated the law of God, but yet the whole time they're planning and plotting how they can murder Jesus. Now I think somewhere in the Bible it says that it's wrong to murder. Alright, so you see the, the hypocrisy here. Alright, and so here's the Pharisees. And they're, they're looking for anything, anything to, to accuse Jesus of. And, and this reminded me that whenever we're not right with Jesus, we will do things that will dishonor the Lord and be completely blind to it. Listen to me. These Pharisees genuinely thought that by plotting against Jesus, that they were honoring God. And if we're not right with Jesus, if we're not right with Jesus, if our relationship with Him is not where it needs to be, then we'll be deceived, we'll plot, we'll scheme, we'll say mean things against one another, and be completely blind to the destruction of it. The Pharisees' laws, according to the Pharisees, you can only heal on the Sabbath if somebody's life was threatened. Well, here's a man, and all he has is a withered hand. Not a life-threatening disease. Now, the text doesn't say this, but I seem to think that the Pharisees purposely planted this man on that day. Because they wanted, because they knew, they knew that Jesus would heal this man. Now, you talk about blindness. They knew that Jesus was going to show compassion But they had a problem with Jesus doing that because He was going to heal somebody on the Sabbath, breaking their rules. So they set up this plot. Again, this man's placed in the synagogue. They knew Jesus would heal him. And notice Jesus' reaction. He heals the man. He heals the man. Jesus would not submit Himself to the rules and regulations of the Pharisees. Because in essence, what Jesus says here is, He asks them a question. He says, I mean, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to harm, to save a life or to destroy it? And so Jesus was saying, a refusal to do good is ultimately to do evil. Jesus said in Matthew 26, verses 36 through 40, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The Pharisees, they kept the letter of the law without the life of the Spirit, which was love. Completely blind to it. And you know what? Here's a man. He had a withered hand. We don't know how long he had that withered hand. And then he's healed. His hand, again, Jesus didn't put him into a six-month recovery program. He didn't have to go get physical therapy on his hand. Immediately, his hand is restored to perfection. Now, you would think that if you were in love with God, you would rejoice. It's not what the Pharisees do. They frown. Sour Patch Kids, right? That's what they were eating. They were upset. They were upset. And so, really, we see another illustration of last week's lesson. Old wine can't be put, or, or the old wine, you can't put it in new wineskins. Old wine and the new wine of the gospel. 
They don't mix. Dead legalistic religion, void of love, based on man-made rules and traditions. All right, so how do we apply this? Three words of application. Three words of application. Ultimately, we see the danger of religion here. This is what we see. Dead, lifeless religion. That's what the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders of the day, that's what they had. Dead, lifeless religion. And church, if we're not careful, we too face this same danger of falling, of following dead, lifeless religion. It can come in two forms. You're lost. And you think you're right with God because you keep all the rules. Really, all you have is dead religion. And even as believers, if we're not careful, as saved people, we can fall into this religion trap. Okay, so three words of application. Number one, religion, religion, lifeless, dead religion will bind you to rules and regulations. That's what religion is all about. It's all about keeping the rules. It's all about performance. Performing in order to try to please God. In order to try to earn His favor. You have all the box, and as long as you check off all the boxes, in your mind, you're good. Hey, I've been baptized. I've joined the church. I come to church every Sunday. I pay my bills. I check off all the boxes. I'm good. Or so you think. But that's not what a relationship is about. Christianity is not about rules and regulations. It's about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about coming to that place in your life where you acknowledge your need for forgiveness and you turn from your sins and you by faith embrace the Savior and you are set free. You are forgiven of all your sins and now you are set free in order to serve Christ. It's about grace. Now, grace is not a license for sin. In fact, if you've truly been saved by grace, it will be the motivation of your heart in order to honor the Lord with your life. And you, through His power, will do everything you can to keep His Word because you love Him. But you keep His Word not in order to earn His favor, but because of His favor in your life. It's no wonder Jesus said, Come to Me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you Rest. The Jews of Jesus' day, they needed rest. Because can you imagine? I mean, we laughed when we, when we read all those regulations and everything. But if you lived in those days, you were bound to that. And it was a burden on you. And so Jesus says, hey, I'm coming with the gospel. It's a message of grace. It's a message of freedom. The book of Hebrews talks about this, this issue of, of rest. So, so there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his, in, entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. I wonder today, you are war slam out because you're playing a religious game. You're trying everything you can to keep all the rules and you're just hoping that that will be good enough for God. But as long as you are basing your assurance in your performance, there is no hope. Because even on our best days, we still fail. So religion will bind you to rules and regulation. I'll never forget, uh, Michelle and I, we had gone on this uh, mission trip with a, a group from our former church. We had gone down to Mississippi. It was right after Hurricane Katrina. And we had gone to this church. This church had been completely devastated by a flood and... Um, and they had rebuilt their church, and then they were trying to go out and help others. And we were there on a Wednesday night, and we were singing. We were worshiping the Lord. And a group of us from our church, we started clapping. You remember this, Michelle? We started clapping. And the pastor of the church stood up with a very, very serious look and tone on his face, and he said, we don't do that around here. Now, initially, I thought he was joking, but he wasn't joking. We don't enjoy our relationship with Christ because we're bound to religion. Now, I don't know his heart. He may know the Lord. I'm not judging his heart, but the point is, 
even as believers, if we're not careful, we build up all these fences around our lives and we depend upon the rules and the regulations. We find ourselves focusing on keeping the rules instead of just enjoying who we are in Christ. Number two, religion will breed self-righteousness in you. Religion will breed self-righteousness in you. Because see, if it's all about keeping the rules and regulations, if it's in your mind you think, okay, I'm good as long as I keep all the rules and regulations, then what will begin to happen with you is you now will begin to judge everybody else who doesn't keep all your rules and regulations. Your convictions now have to be everybody else's convictions. Okay? And so... You find somebody that, you know, they don't particularly have the same convictions as you, and all of a sudden now they are unholy, and you are holy. You're right with God, and they're not right with God. But a relationship, it's about not judging and condemning, but it's about showing mercy. How can you tell if somebody has experienced mercy? They're willing to extend mercy. Because you recognize where you would be without the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ in your life. So then when you encounter another brother or sister in Christ who falls into some kind of sin, you don't judge them and condemn them. You love them and you pray for them. Because you have been forgiven much, you want to extend that same mercy and grace. But religion breeds self-righteousness. Hey, I'm all right. I keep all the rules. I look good. I look spiritual. These over here, well, you know, they're hooked on drugs and alcohol and they say things they shouldn't say and they do wrong things. They're not right with God and I am. Self-righteousness. Number three, finally. Religion will blind you to God and others. These religious leaders... They, they were so consumed about keeping all the rules and regulations that in reality they had no love for God. And how do we know they had no love for God? Because they had no love for people. That was the problem. They were just concerned about keeping the rules and they were completely blind to the needs of those around them. And their hearts were hard. Amos chapter 5, Amos says this, For I know... How many are your transgressions and how great are your sins? You afflict the righteous and take a bribe and turn aside needy in the gate. I hate and despise your feast and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them and the peace offerings of your fatted animals. I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. So mere religion totally disregards those who are in need, and that is totally unacceptable to God. So a true love for God, true saving religion, will have a love for God, and it will show itself in a concern for people. People's physical needs and people's spiritual needs. This is what I have found. People who have experienced God's grace and mercy, they want to help those around them who have needs. They also have a burden for people's spiritual needs because they recognize that the greatest need in everybody's life is to be right with God. And that can only happen one way, through Jesus Christ, through knowing Him personally, through having your sins forgiven through faith and repentance in Him. So this morning, we have to ask ourselves this question. Do we just simply have religion? It's a great danger here in the South. You know, hey, my family's always gone to church. This is just the thing that you do. Do you just have lifeless religion? Or do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? And life is a joy because you know that you've been set free. And you've been set free to not only serve God, but to serve others. Let us pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for your love and mercy and grace. Oh, Lord, we need you. For, Father, it is so easy to, to read about the Pharisees and to say how blind they were. And they were. 
But Lord, it is so easy to be just as deceived. Lord, help us not to fall into the trap of religion. Lord, you're not looking for religious people. You're looking for people who are humble, who acknowledge their need for Christ, who love you with a true and sincere heart, and who show that love by extending grace and mercy to others around us. Lord, I pray that we would be obedient during this time of invitation. We love you. We thank you for the truth of your word. There's power in truth. There's liberty in truth. And we thank you that in your grace, you gave it to us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.